This is Latter-day Presentations, where we discuss topics and issues of faith for Latter-day Saints. Welcome back to our presentation on the authorship of Isaiah for Latter-day Saints. And in this section, part five, we're going to talk about the background of the book and then questions around composition and shifts in the text and how those relate to the theory of multiple authorship. To begin, let's do a quick overview of the background of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah of Jerusalem prophesied from around 740 to 750 BC to around 695 BC. That means his ministry might have gone on for 40 or more years. It's hard to say for sure. But we don't know if there were significant breaks in his ministry. Well, the text of Isaiah is not very long for someone who operated for 30 or 40 or more years, right? We have 66 chapters in the text of Isaiah as we have it. And if he produced those in a consistent, methodical time frame, like one chapter per month, for example, <laughs> all of the work of producing the text of Isaiah as we have it would have been done in just a few years, not 30 or 40 years. So this does beg the question, what was he doing during those 30 or 40 years? Did he have significant breaks in time where he traveled or spent time among different groups of people? We don't know. We don't have a lot of details about his life. But just this mismatch between the length of his ministry and the length of his book suggests that a lot happened that may have shaped his perceptions over time, right? And it's worth actually spending some time and, and guessing and looking at historical examples of prophets in the past and and how their messages were impacted by different kinds of events that happened during their lives over spans of decades. Some of the chapters feature Isaiah speaking in the first person. Some feature narratives about Isaiah. Some are just prophetic writings with no specific attribution to Isaiah in the text. Isaiah mentions disciples who bind and seal prophecy, which has led some scholars to envision a school of Isaiah disciples who kept his writings and possibly expanded them. During his lifetime, the northern kingdom of Israel was defeated by the Assyrians, and Isaiah was an anti-establishment and then an establishment prophet for some of his ministry, interfacing regularly with the royal court. Also, tradition holds that he was killed during the reign of Manasseh. Okay, now let's talk about shifts in perspective and setting in the text of Isaiah. And here we're going to talk about the basic assumption that is at the heart of the multiple authorship theory for the text of Isaiah. Sections of Isaiah differ, which some scholars view as evidence of multiple authorship. Here's Hugh Williamson. He's an Isaiah scholar. He says, The setting presupposed by different parts of the book varies considerably. Much of Isaiah 40 through 55, for instance, takes its standpoint with those who have suffered judgment in the past and should now be anticipating deliverance. What sense would that make in the 8th century BC in Judah? The messages of the different parts of the book are so diverse that they cannot be understood as other than accompanying historical change. If all of them were delivered and considered together in the 8th century BC, they would be contradictory. It is only as they are related to different periods that the underlying unity becomes meaningful. Again, this assumption is at the heart of the multiple authorship theory. This assumption holds that if Isaiah produced a text, then it should be completely relevant only to the people around him. And there should never be any shifts in thinking or shifts in geographical setting or any of those kinds of things. These assumptions are very poor. He imagines a prophet who doesn't travel. He imagines a prophet who doesn't respond to geopolitical events, for example, who never undergoes a shift in his thinking. And we'll see as we proceed that there are a lot of good reasons to reject these assumptions. Let's start with Isaiah 6 and a common theme that we see throughout the text of Isaiah, and that is references to prophecy and the senses. So the altar translation of Isaiah 6, 9 through 10 says, And he said, Go and say to this people, Indeed you must hear, but you will not understand. Indeed you must see, but you will not know. 
Make the heart of this people obtuse, and block its ears and seal its eyes, lest it see with its eyes and with its ears hear, and its heart understand, and it turn back and be healed. And now here's Joseph Blankensop. He says, other linguistic and thematic indications of later interest in Isaiah 6 have been pointed out in recent commentary. For example, the throne raised up on high and the theme of spiritual blindness and deafness. This is a theme that we see throughout the text of Isaiah. Isaiah's prophetic call began with the notion that the people were not receptive to his teachings. And as we proceed, we'll see that the response to this lack of receptivity was to actually package his revelations in ways that the people would not receive them, either during their lifetime or, or just for some period of time, and then they would be revealed at a later date. Here we have a table that I created that shows different passages throughout the text of Isaiah where we see recurring themes around the senses, our sight and our hearing and our perception. And you can see that I've color-coded these references so you can see how they correspond throughout the text, beginning in Isaiah 6 and then going all the way up through Isaiah 59. And these consistent thematic elements span what Bernhard Doom considered Proto, Deutero, and Trito Isaiah. Here's Blankensop again. He says, at intervals throughout the book, we hear of people hearing without comprehension and seeing without perception of the stopping of ears and shedding of eyes, and all of this induced by the very delivery of the prophetic message. Later he says, we are therefore dealing with the issue of the reception or non-reception of prophecy. What is rejected is the instruction of God communicated through prophetic intermediaries, in which connection we note the studious avoidance of the standard term for prophets, Nebi'im, and the corresponding verbal forms in favor of the less specific language of seeing, visioning, and speaking. Why is this important to understand? It's important because when scholars claim that Isaiah's message had to be completely relevant and understandable to his audience around him, his context, we're seeing here that that is absolutely not the case. It is acknowledged at the outset that Isaiah's audience was not receptive to his message. His sayings would need to be sealed up and packaged actually to keep them from the people until a later date. Here's another quote from Joseph Blankensop. And when we talk about the packaging and delivery of Isaiah's sayings, it's helpful to understand some clues in the text as to what that means. Blankensop says several different verbs are used for writing on a tablet. And if one can inscribe or engrave on the hand, one can surely do so on papyrus, as here. The book would be in the form of a scroll, which would be inscribed on one side and then sealed. The command addressed to the prophet to write is in evident parallelism to the writing and sealing of a text after the failure to influence Ahaz a generation earlier. Here he's talking about a passage in Isaiah 30 that parallels a command that he issued back during the time of Ahaz to bind and seal up his prophetic testimony for later revealing. Now let's look at these side by side, Isaiah 8 and 30. We have a formula that Isaiah employs here. In this formula, Isaiah says, because people reject Yahweh's influence and instead they place their trust in other influences. Yahweh will give them the display of raw power that they seek, and it will backfire on them, breaking through any attempts to restrain it. And he commands, write the prophetic word and keep it for later. Returning to this table of references to sensory receptivity to prophetic teachings, let's overlay this with references to how the prophetic word is supposed to be handled. In chapter 8, we have bound and sealed prophecies. In chapter 29, references to a sealed book. In chapter 30, a tablet and scroll. And then beginning in 41, we start to see passages of fulfillment. And something that we see in these passages of fulfillment is a reference to idolatry. We're actually given a reason for the purpose for sealing up prophecy for later revealing. It's so that later audiences can look and see that a prophecy was fulfilled and they can't attribute that to their idols. 
Isaiah 48, 3 reads, I declared the former things from of old and they went out from my mouth and I announced them suddenly. I acted and they came to pass. Because I know that you are obstinate and your neck and iron sinew and your forehead bronze. And I declared them to you from old. I announced them to you before they came to pass so that you would not say my idol did them and my image and my cast image commanded them. These passages speak to problems in the assumption that Isaiah's message had to be completely relevant to everybody in his immediate context. When we see these passages talking about binding and sealing up, keeping things actually hidden from his audience, why would we assume that there is some standard of relevance for the people around him? Well, that is really kind of a modern assumption projected back onto the ancients, and we need to see that for what it is. Here's Marvin Sweeney. He says, The disputation speech proper in 48, 3 through 11 then focuses on Yahweh's control of events. Yahweh's assertion that Yahweh foretold these events becomes a key element in the argument. Further down, he says, any claims that the people did not hear, know, or have their ears opened cannot be sustained because these events were foretold in chapters 1 through 33. Indeed, Yahweh commanded Isaiah to make sure that the people could not see, hear, or know what was to happen to them in chapter 6. In conclusion, why assume that all of Isaiah's sayings were distributed to his 8th century audience, especially when, number one, we are told that he had disciples who were tasked with binding and sealing up his words. And number two, Isaiah 48 seems to suggest that his prophecies may have been kept hidden until the time of their fulfillment. And again, there's purpose in that. It's to avoid the possibility that the people would attribute fulfillment of prophecy to idols. Joseph Blankensop says in the final and somber act of the drama, Isaiah has his utterances delivered during the crisis, sealed, secured in a receptacle of some kind, and committed to his disciples. It is possible that the verbs are used metaphorically, or at least in the sense that Isaiah's discourses are committed to memory by disciples. However, the parallel with 29, 11, 12, referring to the words of a sealed book, and with 30, 8 through 11, which speaks of a tablet and a book serving as witness, both in the context of prophecy as problematic, suggests that we take them literally. In that case, the message and instruction indicate a text written on papyrus, wrapped in cloth, and put for safekeeping in a jar or other container. Now, this begs a question. Why do we not see references to binding and sealing up of prophecy in the latter half of the book of Isaiah? Well, the Talmud offers an interesting insight. In the Talmud, we are told that Hezekiah and his court became responsible for putting together the book of Isaiah. And if that's the case, then the handling of Isaiah's prophetic sayings became an institutional responsibility held by the scribal school of Hezekiah's royal court. How they went about doing what they did, we don't really have a whole lot of data. And they definitely might have continued that pattern of sealing up some portions of his sayings for later revealing after prophecy was fulfilled. That's conjecture. It's just a guess. Because again, we don't have a whole lot of data beyond this very simple, vague reference in the Talmud. And now let's throw a little bit of a curveball into our analysis so far. Here is some discussion of Isaiah 48 from Joe Spencer. He says, having indicted Israel in these general terms, the prophet next describes the lengths the Lord has to go to to keep the covenant people from wandering too far astray. This comes in two sequences. The first focuses on the former things, on things declared to Israel from the beginning. The second then focuses on new things, on things created now and not from the beginning. The Lord, it seems, has found it necessary to employ a double strategy to keep Israel in check. First, knowing Israel to be obstinate, he made a number of things known to them by the prophets long in advance. In the Lord's words, before it came to pass, I showed them thee. And his reason for doing this, he states clearly, I showed them for fear lest thou shouldst say, mine idol hath done them. Some words attributed to the Lord, it seems, had to be in circulation from ancient times so that Israel couldn't claim their fulfillment was a function of whatever newfangled idolatrous cult they happened to have discovered quite recently. 
And now let's talk about a little bit of a twist that the Book of Mormon offers on this text. Spencer's talking about the difference between the Book of Mormon text of Isaiah and the King James Version. He says most of the differences between the two versions here seem to focus on exactly when the prophecies in question were to have been fulfilled. In the biblical version of verse 3, for instance, it reads as if the Lord in ancient times not only revealed, but also did the things prophesied of, and they came to pass, he says. In the Book of Mormon version, however, the clause, and they came to pass, entirely disappears, and the word did becomes did show, so that it's only said that the Lord showed things in vision anciently, not that they were also accomplished in that time. He says the word it becomes plural, them, in the Book of Mormon text. Will you not declare them? with the suggestion that Israel has been maliciously keeping the prophecies in question secret. Now, I would suggest that we don't necessarily need to assume that the Lord is accusing the Israelites of malice in keeping these prophecies from people. But this is kind of an interesting twist on what we've been saying. The showing of fulfillment of prophecy rather than the actual fulfillment of prophecy. This is something that's definitely interesting to consider. And now let's talk about shifts in perspective. Is it possible for a prophet to actually have a major shift in perspective to the point where modern scholars would say, oh, that must have been another author for that specific passage, right? So again, this is a very, very important assumption that undergirds the multiple author hypothesis. Here's Benjamin Summer. He says, several scholars maintain that passages in Isaiah 1 through 39 that prophesy good fortune were included there in order to prepare the way for chapters 40 through 66, or that they were added to the book of Isaiah under the influence of Deutero-Isaiah after his work was already part of the book. Such a view presumes that Isaiah was a prophet of doom who would not utter anything other than condemnation. But the same thinker who predicted disaster could also foresee its end. Two ideas do not indicate the existence of two authors. Indeed, one of Isaiah's most characteristic notions, that of the remnant that will return, itself combines his positive and negative viewpoints. Yes, there will be survivors of the coming disaster, but only a few. To attribute anything positive in first Isaiah to Deuter-Isaiah or his influence is to suggest a bizarre dichotomy in which the older author or authors could think no happy thoughts. How did assumptions such as these become the bedrock of those who argue that the book of Isaiah is a redactional unity? The last assumption exemplifies a sort of historicism gone awry. It reflects the notion, unfortunately common in biblical studies, that certain ideas could not have been uttered at given times or by particular individuals. Now, as we think about what Summer is saying here, think back on what Hugh Williamson said. He said that there must have been multiple authors because... There are parts of the book of Isaiah that seem contradictory, right? Conflicting points of view. Summer says that is absolutely not evidence of multiple authorship. Here's another great quote from Benjamin Summer. He says, even if it is surprising to suggest that an 8th century thinker might have hoped for peace in Israel and among the nations, this would not make the suggestion impossible. Micah and especially Isaiah conceived of notions that were unexpected, even bizarre. Therein lies the genius of any original thinker. To deny that an idea could have been thought of in a given age is to deny the possibility of intellectual creativity. Such a denial is a very odd position for a scholar of the humanities. This example, taken from the study of prophetic literature, illustrates how some scholars think that a particular theme must date to a particular era. This is the first mistake, which I discussed in the previous section. Furthermore, this example shows that scholars who make the first mistake often commit a second as well. They don't pause to note that the evidence they used to support their dating could also be used to support some other dating. As a result, one often finds that several scholars who commit the first mistake nonetheless differ in their identification of the one era in which the text must have been written. This second mistake we might term the lack of a control. It is quite common in Pentateuchal studies. Now, continuing our analysis of this assumption, here is a quote from Shalom Paul on Trito Isaiah, or Third Isaiah. Shalom Paul is part of a group of scholars who actually does not believe in a Trito Isaiah. This group of scholars believes that chapters 40 through 66 are basically an authorial unity. 
and that you can't separate them out into second and third Isaiah. Shalom Paul says the so-called watershed between chapters 55 and 56, separating Deuter Isaiah from, quote, Trito Isaiah, unquote, is artificial since, as will be shown in the introduction to chapter 56, there are clear linguistic and thematic links between the two. It appears, therefore, that there is no conclusive reason to attribute chapters 56 through 66 to a distinct and later prophet living in the mid-5th century or later. The period reflected in these chapters is no later than the early years following the return. If one draws a line between the two sections of the book, the line should be drawn between the prophecies delivered in Babylonia and those delivered in Jerusalem. One should not speak of two different personalities, but of a change in locus following the prophet's return to Israel. Okay, he's saying that rather than thinking of two authors, we can think of one author who spent time in two different locations, a change in locus. As I mentioned earlier, the possibility that Isaiah traveled to different places is something really important to consider. If he traveled to different places, obviously, just like anybody who travels throughout the world, it would be normal to expect some shifts in his perspective or tone or content among his sayings. And there's no reason to assume that those come from different authors. Paul says most commentators still divide chapters 40 through 66 into two, Deuter Isaiah and Trito Isaiah. In contrast, I maintain that chapters 40 through 66 are one coherent opus composed by a single prophet. Now, this is an important research question. Isaiah prophesied for about 30 to 40 years. Do we see evidence of shifts in language, tone, emphasis, perspective, and style over 30 to 40 years among modern prophets? Like Isaiah, do they sometimes shift in response to major geopolitical events? I created a post at Nauvoo Neighbor to illustrate what I'm saying here. And it has some different writing samples from my own life that span a couple of decades. And you can go there and look and kind of see for yourself if there have been shifts in my tone and content and perspective over just 20 years. Now, Zion theology is a really great example of this really poor modern assumption of consistency applied to ancient prophetic writings. Some scholars see Isaiah as having only one possible view of God's protection for Jerusalem. In other words, the idea that God is going to protect Jerusalem no matter what happens. Some scholars do think that Isaiah held this view of God's protection for Jerusalem and that he never would have had any shifts in thinking about it. But let's look at that a little bit more closely. John Hayes says, Yahweh protects Zion as a lion guards his prey or as birds hover over a nest. In time of trouble, the Lord descends to fight upon Mount Zion and upon the hill thereof. The Lord protects the city, delivering it from its enemies and rescues it like the bird flying over its nest to chase away intruders. The battle is won with a sword, not of men, but by the Lord whose fire is in Zion and his furnace in Jerusalem. In the light of these oracles, it seems safe to assume that Isaiah used the common Zion tradition of the city's invulnerability to support the people and to proclaim the message of Yahweh. But Isaiah radically alters this tradition of the invulnerability in two ways. The prophet called for faith in Yahweh as a condition of salvation and protection. The second way in which Isaiah radically changed the old Zion tradition was by placing the onslaught and attacks of the enemies within the arena of God's activity and work. This perhaps occurred during the Assyrian onslaught and oppression of Jerusalem. And here's Joseph Blankensop on this same subject. He says, The mythic language about Jerusalem as the city of the divine presence, center of world pilgrimage, exalted and inviolable female, and the like, is not a creation of either Isaiah himself or his disciples. He would, of course, have been aware of these ideas and their cultic expression. But where we encounter such language throughout the book, and not just in the authentic sections, it more often than not refers to an ideal construct over against the empirical reality. Isaiah himself does not hesitate to compare this real Jerusalem with Sodom, denounce it as a harlot city, and hold out the prospect of ruin and destruction. Only in one saying, probably from the time of Hezekiah's rebellion, does he speak of Yahweh fighting for and protecting his city, though even in this instance there are conflicting interpretations.
And now let's talk about shifts in geographical setting. And this is important because scholars have long held a view that second Isaiah was produced in Babylon. And this assumption has fed a massive amount of scholarship on the book of Isaiah. But recently, a scholar named Lena Sophia T. Meyer wrote a book where she challenged this assumption, and I believe very successfully. And I want to read part of the introduction for her book. She says, It has long been the consensus, in itself a remarkable feat, given that biblical scholarship is not known for its consensuses, that Isaiah 40 through 55 was composed by the Jewish exilic community in Babylon between roughly 586 to 539 BC. Eight arguments are usually advanced for the traditional position that Isaiah 40 through 55 was written by the Jewish exilic community in Babylon. And then she mentions the eight arguments that scholars put forward. And she says, while it has been acknowledged that taken separately, these arguments are not particularly compelling, scholars generally maintain that when combined, they yield a definite picture of the historical context of Isaiah 40 through 55, that of the exilic community in Babylon. In this monograph, I shall challenge the widespread contemporary view of a Babylonian provenance of Isaiah 40 through 55. Through a careful study of the textual evidence, I shall endeavor to show that these eight arguments cannot stand up to close scrutiny, whether treated alone or taken altogether. It follows that the accepted view of a Babylonian provenance of Isaiah 40 through 55 rests upon a shaky foundation and thus cannot be sustained. T. Meyer continues. She says, my reasons for challenging the near consensus of a Babylon. T. Meyer continues. She says, my reasons for challenging the near consensus of a Babylonian provenance of Isaiah 40 through 55 are twofold. First, I am inherently suspicious of any kind of consensus and believe that it is academically healthy to reopen settled debates. And she says, I am uneasy about what appears to be the pro-exilic sentiments in many interpretations of Isaiah 40 through 55. In other words, I believe that many exegetes are influenced consciously or unconsciously by the notion of the superiority of the exilic community in Babylon over against the one in Judah, as expressed, for example, in some passages. She says, as a result, these interpreters are pre-programmed to regard Isaiah 40 through 55 as a product of the former rather than being open to listen to the claims of the texts of Isaiah 40 through 55 themselves. This is interesting. Why does she use this word pre-programmed? Well, she's saying that these interpreters of the text of Isaiah are biased in a certain way, and that is steering them to a narrow set of possible conclusions about the text. So let's continue our discussion of geographic shifts in setting. This is an important area of discussion because scholars use these arguments extensively to justify their belief in multiple authorship. T. Meyer says the question of provenance of Isaiah 40 through 55 is important because the geographical background of text is a crucial aspect of historical critical exegesis. In order to understand the message that an author wants to communicate to his or her audience, it is imperative to locate both that author and his or her audience in time and place. At present, exegesis of Isaiah 40 through 55 is based on and also builds upon the assumption, again, let me reiterate, the assumption <laughs> that all or at least significant parts of the material were uttered or composed in Babylon and aimed at the Jewish community there. As a result, there are plenty of examples in which exegetes interpret a verse in Isaiah 40 through 55 against the background of life in the Babylonian diaspora. This type of exegesis is in itself methodologically correct. Yet, if it became clear that this interpretation of the background of the text is unsupported by the larger context, then such exegesis will turn out to be irrelevant. These are definitely fighting words because... She is absolutely correct in saying that if you want to do accurate exegesis of a biblical text, you have to have a clear understanding of the setting for that text. And if scholars don't have a clear and consistent view of setting, their methodology might be correct, but their conclusions might 
be way off due to their biases and their poor assumptions. Here are a couple of quotes, the first from T. Meyer. She says, as shown by Bear and Paul, there are definitely cognate expressions in the biblical Hebrew of Isaiah 40 through 55 and in the Akkadian of the Neo-Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian royal inscriptions. At the same time, these same expressions appear elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible with more or less frequency. Following Talmud's principle outlined above concerning giving preference to interbiblical parallels, it follows that we cannot argue soundly that the language of Isaiah 40 through 55 is directly influenced by the Akkadian literature. Instead, it is more likely that it reflects shared Semitic ways of expression. And here is Klaus Baltzer in his commentary on Second Isaiah. He says the Babylonian gods Bel and Nebo were known elsewhere as well. The Chaldean astronomy and astrology was well known in the ancient world, so that familiarity with their practices was not restricted to Babylon. Moreover, the query about the place of performance and the query about the place where the author composed his work are two separate questions that must be distinguished from one another. I myself believe that Jerusalem is most probably the place where Deuteroisaiah's work was composed. One of Deuteroisaiah's themes is the restitution of Zion and Jerusalem. The walls are part of this restitution. Yahweh writes them into his hands, and the mural crown represents the new city. According to chapter 55, Jerusalem is the goal of pilgrimage. A minor geographical detail could be of interest for the locality question. In 49.12, the directions or points of the compass are named. The already mentioned land of Sinim, probably standing for the south. Seen from Babylon, Syene Elephantine in Egypt does not lie to the south. This is rather the case if the standpoint is Jerusalem. The author seems to be familiar with Jerusalem's geographical position and incorporates it into his text. Now, concluding this section, questions of setting are important and there are serious problems in the consensus around setting. Shifts in perspective or setting do not indicate multiple authors. And the assumption that all of Isaiah's sayings had to be immediately understandable and relevant among 8th century Judah is a flawed assumption. We know that there was a pattern of sealing up of some of his prophecies to come forward at a later date, and that's due to both the problem of idolatry and also the people's receptivity. We have serious gaps in understanding about setting. Was Isaiah only ever in Jerusalem conducting his activities openly, and why would we assume that? Again, going back to this quote that we read from Hugh Williamson, we can look at what he said about contradictions and about shifts in setting. And it's valuable to really unpack these problems with his assumptions. And these assumptions really are at the heart of the multiple author hypothesis for the text of Isaiah. As we conclude, I want to remind you that these slides are available for download at Nauvoo Neighbor, and you're free to use them however you please. This has been an episode of Latter-day Presentations. We would like to remind viewers that our channel represents our own views and not necessarily any official positions of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We hope this presentation has been informative. Our notes for this show are at Nauvoo Neighbor and the link can be found in the show description. Also in the show description, we have a link to provide feedback. If you would like to suggest a topic for discussion or if you would like to contribute a presentation on a topic of interest to you, let us know. Thanks again for joining us.